we're recording. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the fifth appointment uh, at the Grand Tour of Italy, where we're going to introduce you with incredible wines from Sicily and Sardinia. Uh, Iman Paolo, as always, um, helped me out to put this together, and my gratitude go to them. They're just fantastic. And my gratitude go to all of you as well for taking the time to be with us tonight. Um, I am, again, uh, my very good wizardry in technology will allow me to share a screen with you. Please be aware that you can sort of um, modulate how many people you want to see. Uh, on the top right of uh, many devices, there is a view button and you can do side-by-side -side gallery. You, you can just watch whoever is speaking and we will be very, very useful later when we're going to have our special guest uh, from uh, Etna, wine producer. We're going to do another Volcano today. That's really quite, quite interesting and, uh, and uh, romantic of us. Um, and then uh, please do use the chat. Uh, the chat is uh, uh, usually at the, at the bottom of, uh, of your screen and uh, you can communicate with us. Paolo, you are Sicilian. Today is your night. Please look after the chat because I've been told off the last time I miss so many messages. So I, I give you the, 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 the chat uh, management uh, is all yours. And um, please be good. Um, and we're gonna ask you a lot about Sicily. Um, and uh, for what is concerning Sardinia, we've been there enough to be able to, to tell a few things ourselves. Excellent. So without further ado, let's try to get this in the right order. That should be a little bit better. Maybe let's have a look. Slideshow. Oh. Let's start, please, uh, Imma, while I'm battling with the technology as usual. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, well, this evening is correct. We will uh, have a look in what is the main island of Italy and uh, as well island in the islands, because of course, yes, we do have island in Italy, the biggest one, we have Sicily and Sardinia, but we do have the smallest one that they are around of the main island that we will talk about with you today as well. The southern part of Italy, especially the island, they are famous for a lot of things. The first thing that comes in mind, of course, is the sea, the beautiful uh, Tyrrhenian Sea that is in both of our island today and uh, as always Bruno we start with uh, what we will not talk about this evening that is a uh, favorite part I believe one one of my favorite parts we're going to talk about what we're not going to talk about it's just a political correctness uh, sort of attack that I had at one point saying but there are so many more things to say about uh, all, all the parts of Italy that we sort of uh, travel uh, through and uh, you know, it's just a shame not to mention them. So we're not going to talk about them, but we're going to mention them. So we couldn't talk about Sicily and Sardinia and, and not talk about pistacchio di Bronte, which is one of the most precious kind of pistacchio. If you are, are, are a pistacchio lover, you go to Sicily, you cannot miss to try pistacchio di Bronte. Um, we, cannot, we, we cannot talk about it um, widely, but you know, Botarga is one of the most precious local food in Sardinia. And remind me exactly the definition of Botarga. Yeah, the Botarga is basically um, cured fish raw. So it's oh, spelled R-O-F-E, which really confused me because I was like, well, it's not raw fish, is it? It's cured, yeah, but it's raw fish. It's a cured fish raw. Uh, it's lovely uh, condiment. Uh, Mrs. Cerneca know about it because he appears in our fridge every now and again. You just you just um, uh, uh, shave it on top of a very nice sort of uh, seafood um, uh, spaghetti all by itself. Uh, it's very tasty and absolutely lovely. Very typical of Sardinia. La Valle dei Templi, which is the Temples Valley. Uh, we're talking about Sicily, of course, Agrigento and all the uh, Greek temples that you can find there. Arancina which was the cause of a big argument between, between Paolo and myself. You wouldn't believe this, but Paolo and myself had a big argument because I called them Arancino or Arancini. And then uh, obviously, because uh, Paolo is from Palermo, uh, they do things their own way and they're very stubborn. So he wanted me to put Arancina ending by A. 
So to avoid uh, total separation of our two uh, entities, I sort of gave in, but I will carry on calling me Arancini all my life and so will my family. And uh, with the girls, many times in our kitchen, we cooked Arancini. Uh, it is a beautiful uh, way to, to pass an entire afternoon because it's quite a long preparation, but it's really worth uh, the taste. Uh, Carazao bread is something that as wine lovers we love. It's a, it's a sort of thin bread, typical of Sardinian cuisine, um, and is uh, a sheet of bread, very, very thin, and uh, you can use it. It's like Carta di Musica is, uh, is known as in other regions, but we love Carazao. We got it in our wine shop in, uh, in Covent Garden. We can't wait for you to visit. Icnusa is the number one selling beer in Italy at the moment and is from Sardinia. Palermo, uh, we're going to open now a, a, a little bracket with Palermo. Paolo, you have uh, one minute to tell us everything we need to know about Palermo. And you start now. So basically, Palermo, I believe, is the, not because it's part of the, it's the city of my region, but it was a, um, really important as well. Like a, a years ago, two years ago, it was the capital of the region for the patrimonio of UNESCO. Is the that... UNESCO, yeah, cultural um, treasures of, yes. uh, of the world, basically. And, uh, so when we go to Palermo, where do we need to go? Teatro Massimo. Teatro Massimo. Monreale. Monreale, that is the biggest church with the small mosaic with the old golden pieces. So there are many ah, okay. pieces there, and there is the best church in the Europe for the mosaic. Fantastic. What do you drink in Palermo? Or what do you eat in Palermo that you don't have anywhere else? So panino con la mirza or pane camiosa, that means uh, uh, bread with the same kind of interior, I can say, uh, of animal. And it's, yeah. it's not very popular in, in the UK, but you know, no. we go with it. Yeah, yeah, no. it's very good. It's a uh, it's, called offal. Yeah, you it's can a sandwich uh, with offal inside. Very nice. Yes, and with the strutto. Anyway, in uh, with, uh, with the animal fat strutto. Which yes. also is not very popular here in the UK, yeah. but you know what? We can't wait to be there in Palermo and uh, uh, eat fat and uh, offals uh, out of a sandwich. Absolutely fabulous! And all, of course, you have cannoli, cannoli siciliani, one of the most famous desserts of uh, of uh, of the world. And if you haven't tried cannoli siciliani, you need to try cannoli siciliani because we you're never gonna forget them ever. And then, since there is summer, 360 day. Yeah, yeah. You're very famous of, of go, going around with a granita, which is basically a ice, ice uh, crunched ice with coffee inside, uh, um, uh, whipped cream, and you, you put all sorts in there. Fantastic. I think uh, Mrs. Czernecker remember about granita in Sicily when we visited uh, no long ago. And then another thing that we cannot forget to say is, of course, for what is concerning Sardinia, La Costa Smeralda, one of the most beautiful places to go on holiday. And I can see somebody nodding in there, which means that probably is so popular that most of you have been. Uh, it is incredible and I love it. And we actually have a wine from there. So we're actually talking about it. Anything else you need to add on Palermo? Palermo. Sfincione, maybe. That is a kind of pizza, I can say, but a little bit more bigger and fat. And they can put some anchovies, tomato, or they can do another version with just um, kind of tuna cheese. So without any salt and then um, pan grattato, so it's like kind of uh, bread, bread crumbs. Uh, crumbs. Oh, yeah. Fabulous. Well, I have to say, probably not that, well, it's strange saying that, you know, listening to it, 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 it sounds like all of this is really not very healthy. But then if you go there, Sicilian people are incredibly healthy. They live a very long life. They got a lot of sun, a lot of sea, they eat, um, everything that we don't, and uh, you know, they, they, they're just fine. So you must have a secret there and we can't wait to visit. For what is concerning wines, we know we're gonna talk about, Ima? Carricante, that is the, uh, the white grape on the Etna mountain. We talk about Etna, but not the Carricante. We have uh, Cannonau, that is uh, the most, I believe the most uh, re famous red grape in Sardinia, that a lot of people um, believe is uh, a kind of cousin of the Granache or the Garnacha in Spain. 
Then we, we will not talk about the Cerasolo di Vittoria, that is the only DOCG of Sicily, and uh, includes two different grapes, uh, the Frappato and the Nero Davola. So the Frappato is more elegant, the Nero Tavola is more powerful. We actually talked about Nero Tavola a little bit last time with Calabria, as in Calabria you, you call it Calabrese, in Sicily the local name is Nero Tavola. We will not talk about Marsava, Marsala, even if we ah, talk about one of the most producer of Marsala, that is Marco De Bartoli, we will not talk about what is the fortified wine that he makes. Um, the Marsala is really famous thanks to English, actually, an Englishman that was Woodhouse. John Woodhouse, um, he decided to, to bring to, to UK, in a way, the, the Marsala, the, uh, there was a, basically a steel wine, and then he put some alcohol in it to fortify it, to make it, uh, uh, let's say, with a longer shelf life. So in that case, he, he created a kind of brand. Even if in the Marsala, they really were doing some, some kind of things like this, but was the, uh, the moment where during the provision time in the UK couldn't be able to, to get the port of the sherry, they decide to not create, but yeah, in a way, the, have the a Marsala. substitute for it. Have a substitute for it. Because yeah. we, we know we know that this island, you know, uh, Britain cannot survive without port. So yeah. obviously somebody had to fill the gaps. Yeah. Absolutely right. Fantastic. And then we're not gonna talk about Grillo. And we're not going to talk about Isola de Nuraghi for what is concerning Sardinia wine. Everything absolutely delicious. We're not going to talk about it. So we're just going to move to the next slide. Whoops. Lost it. Here we go. We spoke about the sea, probably the one main component of what uh, the, the life of the islands is. And uh, those sort of images of really transparent seas, I know that they look like sort of uh, enhanced brochure uh, photos. But they're actually like this, and you can see from the from the heights of the coast, you can see literally uh, boats floating in 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 thin air because it just looks like the boats are floating in in mid air. But it, the, the the sea is absolutely beautiful and it is is a marvel, a marvel to to admire. Obviously, we, the the climate, which is always what we talk about before going to the wine, uh, is. Uh, very important because we're talking about um, high level or on sea level um, uh, growers that are making the sort of high quality wine. Uh, and we cannot avoid to talk about Mount Etna and we will, I think, uh, uh, greatly with, uh, with the Federico in a second. And, uh, you know, there are lots of DOC and DOCG, the nomination of origin. I know the two guys that are with us uh, are Italian, so they know exactly what it means, and I don't have to explain it again. And, uh, you know, for what is concerned in Sardinia, we have this big influence of, of Spain in, in uh, what is uh, the wine culture in there. And we have to say, this time we're not going back on traditional culture, you know, typical of the locals and local grape varieties, etc., because it looks like Although, although they are defined as a local grey variety, it looks like the influence from Spain with the Grenache called Canonao or the Carignan uh, is evident. So um, very, very interesting. And uh, obviously the uh, main variety, Vermentino di Gallura di OCG, uh, located on the north of the island. And I take this uh, opportunity um, to start with our first wine, to raise the glass that we usually do. We've done pretty well, uh, 20 minutes, we haven't even started tasting. As usual, we like, enjoy your wine. Wine number one from Pantelleria. Yes. Pantelleria is uh, famous for sweet wine, especially from the grape that you're actually tasting this evening, that is the DB boy itself. And this, um, is located in the south part of uh, what is the main island of Sicily, like you can see from the, you can see from the map. It's um, really important the production of Zibipo on the Pantellerio island, and it's really nice because if you go there, if you will have an opportunity to go, um, you will have this bush tree, little one that uh, they cannot be too tall because of course there is a strong wind as well that's coming. And uh, they are really lovely. You got this little wall, and then you have this little bush tree, and everything that's coming from the wind. So you got the minerality, the sandy soil, 
soil as well, because of course it's an island, so the majority of it is sand as a soil. And then you have all of these uh, amazing uh, grapes that if you put your nose um, in the glass, you can see how sweet look in the nose as well. So this grape is saying to you, okay, let me dry, and that will make you an amazing pasito, because this is what they make, uh, especially in the Pantelleri Island. Only in the latest year, they decide to make uh, the Zibib as well as a dry wine. And I think uh, it's lovely as well, because it does have an amazing balance on the mouth as a um, acidity, a good acidity for sure, a great minerality in this wine. But the nose is, uh, is amazing. Like if you smell it, you're like, OK, give me three bottles, not only one. So that's uh, why I believe that they make uh, sweet wine, especially. But we do like the dry version as well. And the Marco de Bartoli is one of the, the best producers. You know, when I mentioned the Marsala, uh, Marco de Bartoli is the one that uh, had the opportunity that uh, he put this, uh, he, in a way, renew what was the idea of the Marsala in the past. Because when Gudao started to, to import the Marsala, the idea of the general people of Marsala was in a cheap wine. Whence the Marsala is a, a really amazing nectar. And uh, Marco de Bartoli put this possibility, this, uh, these ideas, as well in what this would be the, um, in Pantelleria, the sweet wine as well. He has uh, a Bucuram winery in this case, that means father of the vineyard. Uh, what do you think, Bruno? I think is extremely different from everything that we had so far. So I like the novelty of this wine. I, love, I like the characteristic. I think the acidity is really, really high. I've been told by uh, one of our guests last week that we are not technical enough and somebody wants a little bit more of tasting happening when we do the wine. Uh, so let's go and do the traditional uh, sommelier tasting from visual. I like the brilliancy of the color. I think he is a, he's a nice sort of straw yellow but it's got a sort of golden brilliance into it. And uh, I think this is, is quite classical of the of the Zibibo, the Zibibo grape. Then as you said in the nose, it's a bit tricky because the nose is saying to you, um, the misek is saying to you, there is a little bit of sweetness there. There's, there is a sort of grapiness of, of, uh, of, um, of the fruit. And then when you, when you have it in your palate, you get hit by this, uh, grapefruit, I would say, you know, you, you can you can really sort of feel the grapefruit, grapefruit, uh, a pink grapefruit, so, you know, like a sort of uh, sweeter grapefruit if you want, but it, it retains a great acidity, a good um, um, freshness, you know, you can you can you can deny this this great freshness, and uh, it makes it really ideal to be drunk by itself or to be paired with food. I absolutely love it. Okay, so we got a few uh, questions. Uh, as Paolo is quite rightly pointing out, shall we, shall we take, Ant and Peter, to everyone, shall we take the wines out to the fridge? Absolutely, yes, you should. We uh, are under the you, you are <laughs> Fantastic. The next uh, question would be the temperature serving. They're asking which temperature would be the wine uh, need to be served this wine. Yes. Um, I'm not a great uh, supporter of really cold white wine unless we are out in the garden and the sun is eating badly. Um, I always say I like, you know, like a sort of a little bit warmer than fridge temperature. I usually take it out of the fridge when we're having our wine. Not that the bottle is ever going to last very long in our household. But, you know, I, 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 I like it a little bit over the, the, the fridge temperature. Would you agree? Just a little yeah. bit over. Said so, this will, 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 will uh, play very well, even in lower temperature, because I like- I would say, yeah, around 10 to 12 degrees, that, uh, that would be my drink. Yeah, I, mean, I agree as well. When it comes to be a warmer, the wine is open up more, especially on the nose, but obviously um, depends the kind of wine. This one is a nice acidity, so it's okay to do 12 degrees, I believe. And then they're asking if it's good with spicy food. The nose is, I believe, is perfect. Uh, and as well, the alcohol content uh, is um, mm. be a perfect pairing, to be honest with the curry, but the alcohol content can help as well because it's not that high. So you still can enjoy this wine with the spicy food, in my opinion. After, after of, of course, after the comments last week on us always choosing wine, a really high uh, alcohol percentage. I didn't do it on purpose. It was already decided. This week we're tasting a wine that is very low in alcohol. It's 11.5%. Uh, 
Um, and uh, not anymore. It's great, yeah. <laughs> uh, and you know, spicy food, Indian curries. I would say yes. Um, it depends which level of spiciness, of course, because I don't think he's got the structure of the body to resist to to things. But I think I think it will go very well with sort of spicy food. Food pairing. I I uh, welcome an idea from last week. Uh, I think Sylvia was proposing. Why don't we try and uh, uh, propose pairing that are understood by the Brits 100%? Uh, because obviously sometimes we come up with food pairing with recipes that are typical Italian recipes, and this sort of goes um, out of the window in many cases. So my food pairing for this uh, wine here, uh, as uh, as we go publicans in the family and they're listening, I will say that this will go perfect with a nice fish pie. A fish pie with a little bit of mash on the top, lovely. I think the the, the structure of it and the, uh, and the texture will uh, will go fantastic with it. Or as the Italians say, light antipastos or antipasti, depending why you watch it. Go 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 cheese, tuna tartare is the sort of food that we see that we see in here. The nice acidity cutting through. Do you agree? If you don't, I move on anyway. <laughs> I do agree, actually, especially yes. with, with the tuna tartare. And uh, talking about spiciness with a little bit of uh, soya sauce would be as well good for me. Ooh, very nice. Very, very, very good. Actually, yes, I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you big time. Excellent. Any more messages? No, let's carry on and let's go to talk. Quickly, because we already expert in Vermentino, it was the first one we had. We were very debated about, you know, should we do the Vermentino in Sardinia as well? At one point, we were about to do the Vermentino even in uh, in Liguria. Uh, but I'm glad that we chose the Vermentino di Sardegna di OCG Shala from uh, Vigna Surrao because he is a fantastic Vermentino. Not that the other one wasn't, but. Uh, I think this is the sort of next level up. Uh, and uh, we are going to the top tier Vermentino of Italy. Uh, this wine especially um, uh, won the Trebicchieri, which is the highest uh, score for the uh, Gambero Rosso um, publication in Italy, which is, uh, which is very, uh, very important. And uh, he won the Trebicchieri, I think, for seven years running. Uh, which is something that doesn't really happen much. And I can tell you that in Sardinia, there are a lot of very good Vermentino producers. So very quickly about Sardinia, the second largest island in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, it, it's an island that, you know, as, as many other lands in Italy, it's been uh, subject to um, uh, many different uh, culture, languages and dialects. Uh, the, the, the grapes that are there, as we already said before, are mainly grapes that are coming, we, we believe, probably with the, with the Spanish influence. Um, and uh, we haven't got a, an enormous uh, wine region. So we're talking about 4,000 hectares, which is, uh, which is, which is not immense. Um, but wines are grown in Sardinia, mainly in an uh, in, uh, area called like uh, uh, Campidano between the, the, the capital of the region, Cagliari, uh, and uh, Oristano in, in the southwest, and uh, Olbia and Sassari and Alghero. The, the southern and western side of the island have also red, white, and dessert wine uh, divided in many denominations of origin control. So I will say that after all, like all Italian uh, regions, because let's not forget Sardinia, and Sicily, they are Italian islands, but they also identify as an Italian region. Um, they have their own identity in what is concerning uh, gastronomy, food, and wine, and no difference in here. Uh, and uh, let's go to the northern part of Sardinia in the beautiful spot of, uh, of uh, it's a beautiful place called uh, uh, Gallura, uh, where we said, you know, is probably one of the best only the destination in the world. If you haven't gone, you need to go. It's absolutely fantastic. And let's meet Mr. Vermentino di Gallura, <coughs> Vigne Surra. Yeah. Oh, Ima, let's yeah. go. Let's do a little. Hi, Federico. 
Ciao, ciao a tutti. Hi. We are a bit late. We're still on the second wine, but uh, you can listen uh, to us talking rubbish about it, and then we go, we go straight yeah. to, uh, to 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 yours. And welcome, warm welcome to Federico uh, from Mount Etna. Excellent. So, Shala, Vermentino di Sardegna, Vigne Surau, 14% ABV, which uh, should tell you something about the order of the wine. Yes, and we um, back we back on track we back on track on our good old uh, strategy of getting everybody drunk before the end of the event yeah well, we try actually to be to be good but we cannot anyway uh, yes the vermentino as you mentioned it is uh, a grape that we already spoke about for the people that were with us before and they have been earlier with us yes we did spoke about vermentino but uh, when you do a tour of Italy, you cannot forget about Vermentino di Caldura, that is the only DOCG that the Sardinia has. And it's uh, an amazing expression of Vermentino. What we understood together is that Vermentino is a grape that likes to be uh, near a sea spot. So what he likes is the sea breeze, what he likes is to be next to the water that comes from the Mediterranean Sea. And as you say, yes, we can find the Vermentino in Liguria, we tried the Bulgari one, and then of course now we talk about Gallura. At best, but for sure, one of the best in Italy as uh, um, um, as, um, as you say, average of uh, um, maturation. So it's a kind of white wine that can last for a long time, for sure. And this particular one is really nice. It comes next, next to a zone that is uh, the Costa Smeralda and the city of uh, Arzagena. That is uh, amazing, of course, as a sea spot, but then you do have amazing vineyards that are not too, above this, not too high on the, on the sea level, like 150. Um, meters on above the sea level and then you can get from this one an amazing uh, minerality and saltiness on nose right so would you absolutely like the um, the tasting again we got a brilliant um, straw yellow going to golden which i always like it's just sort of give me an, an, an anteprima um, of uh, of the actual of the actual wine that follows and this time I can see, I can really see a sort of correlation between the nose and the palate. You know what I mean? You just get a very strong minerality on the palate, the saltiness, what we call sapidity. Uh, and, uh, you know, it is absolutely beautiful to see how this wine is uh, taking over the palate in its complexity. Uh, the minerality is there, typical of, uh, of uh, Vermentino. And uh, is, um, uh, I would say, the persi persistence of the of the um, of the wine in the mouth, and also the fact that together with the, the fruitiness, you get uh, a little bit of vegetal in there. You know, there, there is a, a flower on the nose, a little bit of vegetal, and uh, and uh, great persistence and and uh, and mineral notes. This is what does it for me. W would you like to add anything, Ima? No, I think uh, I agree with you. The minerality of this wine is, the, and the power in alcohol as well. You can feel the power of this wine in the in the mouth. It's totally different from the DB Bob before. There was more on the lighter side of wine, I would say. This one is more powerful, and uh, I uh, I really like it as well. Yeah, that's one of the reasons that I was saying before. The Fermentino calls the sea because the minerality is one of these uh, main com main uh, characteristic. And I think the wind is one of the main characteristics in this case, because obviously the component of the, of the wind, which is called the maestrale, that blows uh, you know, on this part of the coast, is what just gives the sort of freshness and approachability to the wine. Absolutely brilliant. Um, if you ask me uh, for um, uh, food pairing, uh, here we go with our uh, British uh, key of reading, and we're going to go for grilled Dover sole. Uh, and I think that would be fantastic with that. Or also with white meat, fish, shellfish, rice and risotto, vegetables. It's very, very um, mm -hmm. uh, adaptable, I think, with, with many parts of, uh, of the Mediterranean diet. But if you go to Azarkena, to Porto Cervo, to all these beautiful places in that area in Sardinia, 
please don't miss a nice dinner or a nice lunch on the seaside uh, because the kitchens in there and doing, um, um, you know, the, the seafood in there is just out of the world. And uh, as much as it out, out of the world, the seafood in, in Sicily, absolutely. Um, let's have a look. Um, you have a question for you, Bruno. I go Anton Peter uh, saying uh, I would include Sulcis as an important area, especially for his Carignano di OCG. I uh, will say absolutely yes, and I will say let's wait for the last wine because uh, we're just gonna get there. Um, uh, my Europe uh, joined this one maybe more than the first of the other weeks, say Mr. Cerneca. Very well. I think it's a little bit cheaper. So no, no, I think it's more expensive. That's why. Okay, excellent. Have you ever tried the VT of Shala? Verdenia Tardiva, I believe. Ah, the Verdenia Tardiva, yes, very much so, very much so. And uh, last time we had a very long conversation, it was last time, no, uh, two events ago, we had a very long conversation about Verdenia Tardiva uh, with Francesco Bordini from, uh, from Villa Papiano. And uh, yes, uh, I tried it and it's amazing. Really, really nice, nice really, nice. really good. And I think Mrs. Cernecca tried it as well, but it was a few years ago, so I... I believe I understand one. She doesn't remember. Uh, what does vegetal mean? Please um, help me out here, uh, Ima. So we usually uh, find fruits um, in wine and uh, that are very sort of recognizable. Um, other times you, you find vegetable notes or, or uh, how do you say vegetal notes? And um, how could I say? Um, sometimes you find pepper sometimes you find um, you know the, the grass of, of, uh, of um, a field is very is very much you know the grassy sort of notes the veg the vegetable notes I think that is uh, that is uh, the, what I mean for vegetal vegetal like cabbage <laughs> Cab cabbage yes yeah, sometimes you, you do uh, or cauliflowers or something like that Cabbage, yeah, you could, yeah, vegetal. Turnip, root to everybody. Okay, let's go to all, all British vegetables now. Uh, one, two, three. No, we, we exhausted the vegetable conversation. Yes, but yeah, that non-fruity sort of natural tone of the wine. Yeah, and, I would say uh, everything that you can relate to a more some, think in your mind something green instead of a fruit, and then you can maybe relate that smell to something. Oh, I love this. Yeah, yeah, I like the, the, the color. Something green instead of something red or yellow or blue. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Well explained. Thank you very much, Imo. Imo. Uh, Imo, Imo, Imo. Imo is uh, Imo's brother. Obviously, this wine is very good because I'm already talking rubbish. I think what we should do, because we already strapped for time, but we did very well, only 10 minutes late, uh, many of our special guests have been waiting much more than that, Federico. Uh, I'd love to introduce you to Federico Graziani. Federico Graziani, producer from Mount Etna. I'm going to pass you on and uh, for you to talk to us about Etna, an area, Sicily, if you want to, to start. Etna is an area. You, as yep. a producer, we need to be very careful because uh, Federico, I don't know if anybody knows or researched before. Um, he uh, won Best Sommelier of Italy in, in, at the end of the, the 90s. Is that correct, Federico? So yes, well, 1998 was a, a dip, a two lives ago. <laughs> two lives ago. It doesn't matter. You were the best in Italy. So to all the sommeliers in Italy, I can guarantee you that there are millions of them, more than the population, and you were the best of it. So how, how do we... How... And I was working in London at that time. I was Obviously. working just behind the Clarity's Hotel. Oh, you see. Why? Best sommelier, we're going to support you. You're going to win it this time. So from Federico, we're going to understand about Sicily a little bit better. We're going to understand about Mount Etna, the fascination about this, this great place. Uh, we're going to talk about Narello Mascarese, I think. We're going to talk about you, your projects, and how these come about. And then we're going to taste one of the most amazing wines that I have in my selection and I'm so proud to have. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna say over to you. I'm gonna mute myself, not to make too much noise, I promise. No, no, I'm, uh, I'm please uh, make questions because I, if, I, if I get too long, it's good to, to have some, uh, some stops. Um, hello, everybody. As, uh, as Bruno said, uh, I, my first life was in uh, the sommelier business. So I used to work uh, for 20 years in restaurants. 
And that's uh, where I learned about wine and uh, I decided even the taste. And uh, it was that uh, while I was working in a two Michelin restaurant in Milan, when I found a little vineyard that was going to be explanted in the next couple of months. So I said uh, to a friend, uh, Salvo Forti was the person who was helping me in this project. Uh, Salvatore means uh, saver. So I said, Salvo, please uh, help me to save this vineyard. So he couldn't say no, actually. And the vineyard is very small, it's uh, just half an hectare. So you consider the production is. Uh, here we go. Very, just a little small. images here. Yeah. Because, yes, then, and the yield is very low. So uh, consider by half an hectare, I produce usually 1,500, 1,700 bottles. So this is the project that started with Profumo di Vulcano. We are going to taste. After year after year, I started to uh, enjoy my new job and uh, my new passion. And uh, I started. Uh, developing the project uh, with a, a friend and a partner called Antonio Capaldo that you might know quite well. And so since uh, this year I started, I decided to, um, to do just uh, for the first time, I just do this as a business. And, Occupation uh, winemaker. Yes, winemaker, viticulture and uh, and run my winery because i think uh, this in this moment need a lot of energy as you yeah. said so, sorry if i interrupt so until now we always had uh, guests and winemakers that are coming from a tradition of winemaker and they have been winemaker because of that mainly or we have businessmen that want to invest in wine so they became winemaker out of passion and the capacity of being able to spend the money that winemaking actually uh, yes. deserve and, and need and now we have somebody that we really relate to especially him and myself and uh, you know that comes from the service of wine and gets yeah. into winemaking I find this absolutely stunning I, I have to say I started from the the end of the of the story and I'm going back you know from the restaurants uh, from the best restaurants, I have to say, I had the chance to taste and open the best bottle you can imagine in, uh, in the world. I, this is very helpful because I know exactly what I believe is to be a great wine. And uh, of course, I'm not doing a great wine, but I'm working in that direction. So I think uh, it's good to have a comparison from what uh, you have uh, going to do. And I'm working towards that direction, going back towards the, the roots and the health, because from the top restaurant, now I go and work with my workers in the vineyard and it's something really, really magic. Especially in a place like Etna, that is an island and a mountain inside an island. So if you think of Sicily, obviously you cannot think uh, to, to Etna because they are two separate words and it's like uh, when I first tasted the Etna Rosso and as a sommelier this was like the curiosity to do and, and to say why I imagine the Sicilian wine very rich very powerful very round especially and what is this it's something so elegant so thin with the tannins so I, I found myself and I think I, I didn't discover, of course, but at that time, 12, 13 years ago, Etna wasn't as famous as today, but they found a very, very interesting field in which to play. And uh, one side is the mountain, consider the vineyard are between 600 and 800 meters for the red. I produce a white wine right at the limit of the potential of uh, the vineyard. So 1,200 meters over the sea level, I believe is one of the 10th, uh, probably highest uh, vineyard in Europe. Of course, the normal variety, the Sicilian variety, Neralo Mascales and Caricante, they don't grow, they don't ripe at that altitude. So I will have to plant with Salvo 40 different grapes. Northern, 
variety. So Renan Riesling, Evustramina, Chenin Blanc, and some Caricanto. So it's a, it's a place where you can do, you have a lot of paradox because you have a light that is a very Mediterranean. Consider the light of Sicily, I believe is something special. You cannot have it nowhere else. When you go out of the airplane, whenever you fly there, I think I feel this difference in light. At the same time, we are on a mountain. At the same time, we have uh, between uh, the fire, as you see, I believe the imagine of the Etna in the last couple of days, it is uh, simply spectacular. It's something you don't believe is, comes from nature, but it's so powerful, they just come, it could just come from nature. So- Are you scared? Are you scared of Etna of course, these days? Of course you, have, you are, but at the same time, you see this beauty and you say, wow, it's something magic. It's not something you can describe easily. So it's a, it's an amazing it's an amazing uh, place where you have uh, the the for example the volcanic stone. There's something more aesthetic that doesn't uh, or, or does exist in nature. Uh, you can see the lava the lava uh, tree tree uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, from uh, the 1980s is still there. There is no one plant on top of it because lava is really the lava and the and the volcanic stone is really something aesthetic. Nothing can uh, can grow there. Just some uh, pistachio tree and something is the first plant uh, who can reach a volcanic a new volcanic soil. Uh, but the other side you have the sand and the hush. From the volcano, a sort of fertilization that comes from the from the <laughs> from the sky uh, every time uh, that uh, Etna decided to give you this present. Actually, for some fruits, is not uh, very good, but for the vineyard in this period, is something very very good for the composition of the of the soil. So we have uh, in a in a sort of specific place in which uh, you don't have consistency in the ground. And this made uh, Etna as a wine region very protect by mechanization. This is very important to understand why today, after I would say 100 years or 80 years that uh, tractor and mechanization came into the ag agriculture, still in Etna you can find very old vineyard. Most of them, some of them are even um, pre-phylloxera. Pre-phylloxera, yeah. So in the, in the wine we are testing tonight, we have about 30% of pre-phylloxera uh, vines. Uh, we are talking about Nerello Mascalese, but at the same time, we can have a different variety because uh, in this period, when the, the vineyard was created, there were not the perception of a single variety like we have from the Second World War. This is something, a matter, a younger matter. So till this period, till the, I would say the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, we have a, a vineyard that is a blend a groupage of different variety in which you have Nero Mascalese and Nero Cappuccio, they are the main. Actually, I just discovered in my study that uh, Nero Cappuccio has a genetic uh, brother in Sardinia called Carignano. So if we want to have uh, the parent of uh, Nero Cappuccio, we can go straight to Carignano. And I think this is, it says uh, that uh, we are in a, different places but we 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 play with the same card we have we play with the same uh, grape variety and this is fantastic just different names the same for alicante that is another variety in the old vineyard always present that is a granache or canonao so we have a lot of common between the island we have a lot of common and uh, it's just uh, the origin of the soil that is quite different, even if in Sardinia you have a lot of uh, old, very old volcanic soil. So we are away, apart, but very close uh, in some terms. 
And this gives the chance to develop to a single uh, uh, system of uh, viticulture called Alberello that is quite present uh, in the south of Italy, in Apulia, in Sardinia. And it's very important because it gives a very nice balance to the plant and a very nice balance between acidity and sugar to the, to the grape and the wine, of course. So we have uh, lucky enough to, to live in a, in a world where we have uh, specialities. And uh, I started very little with this Profumo di Vulcano. Now my winery has five hectares, so it's growing a little bit. And I think as a site that allowed me to, to do this as a job and, uh, and I love it. Sorry, I couldn't find the unmute button, which is the reason why I never mute myself. Uh, this is absolutely fascinating, uh, Federico. And uh, you know, we, we, th we thank you for the, for the story. It, it, it's incredible. What is the reason why, because obviously the project started with Profumo di Vulcano as a wine, as, as a wine itself. And then is it just a business thing that um, pushed you to, to um, look into uh, expanding the vineyard and, and planting different grapes? No, actually, uh, I was uh, sad because uh, if you consider what 1,500 bottles, especially in the first vintages, this was the number. Um, three bo 300 bottles, I drink it myself uh, during the year. <laughs> so it lasts. 150, 1, 000, I drink uh, in uh, the other 50, and you finish the, the old bottle. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I, I believe uh, you don't. Uh, give a message if your wine has, has been tasted during a year by 2000 people. It's not enough to, to communicate your idea of Etna. That's why I started to do from the younger vine to a more simple Etna, more affordable, not just in terms of price, but also in terms of uh, availability because uh, the problem is uh, when uh, we have so little bottle that uh, the wine lasts for a few months and then uh, you don't have you don't have to talk uh, anymore it's like but at the same time you don't reach as many people as you want to uh, with your idea of etna and so you truly to... are on a mission you are on a mission the mission of the, you know evangelist you're an evangelist of etna now so. i think uh, i have uh, the duty to to talk about um, etna through my wine and i think is fantastic and i have to say the style i have for um, for my wines probably reflect very well what has been my past, because uh, I tried to tend. It's not something that I decided. It's, it comes uh, very natural. I try to, I tend to do wines very drinkable with a great, great uh, drinkness. Um, it's not just related about alcohol, but it's also related by alcohol. I don't like wine too uh, alcoholic. I don't like wine too round. So I think you need, uh, uh, as, as in the wine that we are drinking, you need a tannins uh, like a backbone, nerves, something live, something probably that needs food to be in the best expression. Because um, in my culture, inside the restaurant, wine has always been very close to food. So I imagine I, it's difficult for me to imagine wine with no food. And this is one of the reasons I believe that wine are maybe a bit scorbutic, maybe a bit rough, uh, but at the same time, uh, you drink the bottle and you say, wow, it's finished. And this is for me, probably the best compliment is even more a compliment this than uh, to have a perfect nose on the palate. I, I Everybody's working. asking for magnum bottles for next time. Can we have magnum bottles, everybody? Can we uh, can we have more wine? Because uh, yeah. you know there are some wine that are finishing extremely fast, and yours is one of them. Is it's nearly nothing there? Um, 
you were obviously aware of Jancis Robinson's comment on Etna a few years ago. Uh, yeah. And she sort of described Etna like the Burgundy of, uh, of Italy. Um, have we done a little bit of comparison? Because I know you shouldn't do it, and I know every, but you know, for the consumer, comparisons are very important. And I like sometimes to compare Etna and Rello Mascarese with, with the story in, in, in uh, Burgundy. What would you say to that? What, what do you do reply to, to, to John C. Robinson on that? How can you reply to somebody who is saying uh, that the most incredible wine region in the world is close to yours? I cannot say anything. Yeah, fair I enough. Love she's right. <laughs> I don't know if she's right. I think uh, Etna wines have a great elegance because of a few things, great variety, altitude, climate, soil. So all these make uh, very interesting wine. And we have to say, despite the fact that we have all on uh, volcanic soil, the differences between Contrade are very important. So I have an idea that is a bit uh, retro. I, it's a bit uh, Bartolo Mascarello style. Okay. So I don't believe uh, to make, uh, like many other producers in Etna, to make many Contrade, like uh, all different uh, single vineyard. I believe uh, more to have some of the best Contrade and to balance them to make a great wine. This is something probably a bit retro today, uh, but uh, I love uh, the idea of uh, have more complexity as, uh, as we do have in the vineyard where we have seven, five, six, seven different variety in the Profundi Vulcano vineyard. For me in the future, probably the idea is to balance, to make a big harmony between uh, the best uh, wine um, Contrade in Etna to make uh, the best wine. Um, what is the blend of the wine? Let's, let's get to the wine itself. To Profumo di Vulcano? Yeah, Nerello, Mascalese, Nerello Cappuccio, Alicante e Francisi. Yes. One of them I never heard about, which is Francisi. Um, Francisi. And what are the percentages? And then what, how are they playing? So the, the vineyard is uh, one vineyard, everything is inside. I have to say, we say that these four variety, obviously, obviously are more than this. And in most of the vintages, like this happened quite uh, in a few places, especially in the past, I have about 40, 45 plants of white grapes as well. And if the vintage allowed it, we, Mm, harvest them together so, and vinify together. So I cannot give you numbers because I wouldn't be... Uh -huh. Excellent, okay. And, and but, are we talking about cross-pollination as well? Because obviously that's the fascinating yeah, part when sure. you, when you sure. get the same, different varieties in the same vineyards. Uh, exactly. We had uh, as a guest Marco Primozic that does a, um, um, a blend in a vineyard in which the three or the four varieties are actually growing together. And towards the years, what happened is um, um, the varieties sort of start cross-pollinating and giving life to some sort of, you know, different fruits, yep. you know, yep. always identifiable as such. And this is, uh, that's why I said before, it's not, it, it was quite common because if you think of the Rome Valley, if you think of the Chianti area, if you think of the Friuli, you have this old vineyard in which there is a mix between even red and white grape variety, and especially for the red wine, a little part of white wine can be uh, of uh, white grape can be melted and uh, uh, crushed together with the with the with the red grapes. So um, we do have these four. Mm, Francesi is called also uva francese. There would be French variety, French grape. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems to have something in common with Cabernet Franc. It's, okay. not, it's not a brother, but uh, not a sister, a twin, but a far, far or, along relative. Yeah. Or a twin like uh, Carignano and uh, Nerello Capuccio, <clears throat> but there is a relationship, genetically a relationship. And then we have also a little plant of Caricante, Minella, and Grecanico. 
and we know Grejanico is Garganega, so we go from Sicily to Soave and back. And this is just fantastic because you see the grey variety, the good grey variety moves through Italy, but take different names, but the good variety are still there. So absolutely <laughs> fascinating. Should we taste it? You still got some in there. Yeah, you still got some difficult oh. to say percentage, but I would say uh, about 80, 85 percent is uh, by Nerellos. Obviously, you have a little bit more of Alicante that was quite common, especially going up because it's uh, earlier um, ripening grape. Um, I would say five, six percent. And then you have another few points of uh, Francesi and few two, three percent of uh, the white grapes mixed together. Absolutely fantastic. Let's go for it. Yeah, I think from uh, other Etna, what you really feel is the, the nuance of the nose. This is a sort of a Mediterranean nose that is made mainly by the richness of the variability of the richness of the variety you have in the vineyard. I think if I had a vineyard like uh, this just for, and for example, I have it in, uh, in the Etna Rosso, more simple, the, the nose is more precise, it's more polite. In this case, with the, with the Profumo di Volcano, you have an, a nose that is a bit enthusiastic, uh, friendly, uh, Mediterranean, balsamic, majoran, uh, capers. So sort of this aroma, they are not typically characteristic of um, the Nerano Mascalese, but in small percentage, I believe, uh, start to build the, the richness of the nose. And I have to say, I like very much the vintage of 2016. It's probably one of the most elegant wine I ever done. And I probably is uh, my favorite in the 10th. Uh, I, I, I love to say I knew it, but I didn't. But I'm so glad you're saying that because uh, it is an immensely great wine. Um, Andrea is asking, does Nerello Mascalese have an important quantity on antochanins, which are the, the compounds yeah. inside the, the, the skin? Is that right? So if we... Like if Grenache. We, we can say what uh, Nerello Mascalese uh, is related to. Um, that gives the idea of uh, the taste as well. And... Uh, richness of tannins, but not much of antochans. And uh, Nerello Mascalese is uh, the son of uh, a great Italian variety called Sangiovese. So we like to say Nebbiolo and Pinot Noir, but in effect, if it's a genetically uh, probation of a relationship between uh, uh, Nerello Mascalese and other variety, is uh, Nerello Mascarese is uh, uh, originated by Sangiovese and another variety. Is in a burgundy oh. bottle. Is this to cash in on Jancis Robinson? Very funny, Barry, really. What, what can we do without it? Um, or not left on the lease? There is tannins. How long will this age? I have to say, um, I think the potential, it depends even how you vinify the, the, the wine, I believe. Actually, I've been uh, considering this. I've been uh, to, uh, I, I started to study for the Master of Wine in 2009. So very difficult, very, I couldn't make it. <laughs> Obviously, we still are waiting for the first Italian wine, Master of Wine. But, I know. Uh, Sorry, I, I, cou I couldn't do it. I can't study anymore. Sorry. <laughs> du during that period, I had the chance to participate at the wine tasting of Chateau Margot. And Jensis Robinson was there as well. And uh, was like 10 different wines from 20 years. So it was like from 85 to 2005. And the chef de cab starts saying, you know, to a very similar vintage in climate uh, vintage, like 2005 and 85, quite warm, uh, quite uh, rich in, uh, in power as do th those two vintages. 
Today we harvested the grape about 14 days after. And I said, that's something I had the glasses in front of me. And I said, if I had to think, if I had to do a wine, I want to do an 80s wine. And because the, the 2005 is, is a great wine, obviously, but uh, for me, it changes the way of perception, uh, the perception of maturity. And the maturity or the polyphenolic maturity for me, especially in Etna, is not as good because uh, gives a roundness that uh, and a lot of richness, power, pulp, that uh, at the end uh, it's uh, it makes the the wine heavier and it makes the wine. Is um, I, I like to do this comparison between athletes. Um, hundred meters, uh, layer, yeah, muscles, a lot of power, a lot of, and then you see the marathonate, they're all very skinny, bone, skin, and nerves. There's nothing else, and they make 40 kilometers. Um, my idea of wine is. Uh, going in that direction. So my wine, especially at the beginning, are a bit scorbutic, as I said before, a bit rough. But in my opinion, this gives the chance to develop and to mature very slowly. And uh, for what I tasted, I now, uh, now I'm tasting uh, Etnas from the first 2010, 2011, my first vintages, they are still very, very good. So I believe, uh, probably doesn't have uh, the, the length of an Ebbiolo of, or a Bordeaux, but I think between 10 and 15, 20 years, you can have uh, fantastic wine from Etna. Generally I don't speaking. think we, we, I don't think we're gonna get to, to that sort of, <laughs> I yeah, think the they're gonna stuff. finish much earlier. This is the problem, isn't it? That's why we're so grateful that you're producing more wine. So that if we ever have an idea of lying them down, then we don't. I think, you know, I really don't know how to thank you enough for this. Um, and thank you uh, for the attention. <laughs> yes, let's have a look. All of you. Can we, can we get a bad joke from Bruno? Oh, that's Andrea. Oh, that's very good. No, no, I, I don't. After this wine, I, 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 just, I just get serious. I, I can't joke anymore because uh, I'm really in front of uh, something very, very special. And, and again, thank you so much for being with us. Any more questions from the crowd? Any more questions from the crowd? Except I my job. Missing the, uh, the pairing, uh, Bruno. Oh, missing the pairing. This is very good. I um, I did um, I did think about this um, uh, about this pairing, and uh, I, I I go back again onto the uh, my my pub experience, and uh, I I will go for uh, liver. And a nice cutting through, elegant. Uh, because I, I, because obviously I like it very much. Um, and uh, it, it's always very easy to say red meat, you know, red wine, red meat. It's always very easy to say that. And in fact, it's correct because you, you should say that. But I, I will, uh, I will get meat that have uh, sort of more personality and taste. And I think the liver always got a very nice. Also, the texture of the liver, if it's not overcooked, if if it's on the right sort of medium, mm -hmm. a little bit rarish, shall we say, pink in the middle, that you get a sort of nice soft tender inside. I think it will go very much uh, with this sort of texture. But I haven't experimented it, and I can't wait for the pub to be reopening again, because I, I, I will give you a go. That's my verdict. So what, what, will, uh, what will, most importantly, what will Federico go for? Actually, um... It depends on the vintages. If we are talking about this vintage, I have to say, um, I really like uh, the lamb chop as a kind of piece for, um, as, as probably I would think for, for a nice Burgundy or either side, uh, I have to say, I tested with some uh, tuna, with uh, raw tuna or um, green tuna. Oh, a nice steak, yeah. A nice steak, maybe with some uh, black currant or blackberry on top, and 
I would say just to find an excuse and open it and something uh, to cook will come in your mind. But uh, yes, as you said, uh, the most common uh, direction is to go towards, uh, towards the red meat. I, I like Petridge uh, with the uh, Profumo di Vulcano. I would say Petridge yeah. and, uh, and, um, and lamb are probably my first options. Okay, excellent. So game and lamb, very good, excellent. Uh, news from Paolo that is thinking, uh, very good, learning fast, thinking the same dish of Ima. Now you need to tell me which, 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 which food were you thinking about, Paolo? I was wondering uh, with the duck, to be honest with you, when I yeah. the wine, I said, Ima, what do you think about the duck? And she said, I was thinking the same. I said, you know what? I will write, like I'm learning, so. I don't yeah, know why. I say I was thinking, I didn't say you were right. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we're going through every week in here. I believe, uh, I believe but... the duck should be even uh, really great because the duck is a little bit sweeter. And this one with the profumo. Uh, the this, Volcano. Yeah, the Volcano profumo is powerful, is great. I mean, it's just my opinion, you know, that I'm learning, so I'm excused in this case. But if I, excuse, I get Paolo. sorry, always excused. Yeah. That's why. Yeah, we're learning. We all learning. You know, is uh, no nobody is more than a marathon dealing with wine uh, using using uh, Federico's metaphor because you never end learning. I think, and um, I love the fact that um, that Federico wines come from an experience that is incredibly different from many that we see uh, in the wine producing and we wish him the very best, and we can't wait for you to produce even more vintages. And uh, let's hope that Etna behaves in itself, though. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, when I do events uh, and I talk about Etna, I always, uh, I always say three things to remember about volcanic uh, wines. First, and Etna in particular, first is obviously the soil. So the fact that the soil, yeah. as you say, it's going natural, sort of the ash, etc., cetera, uh, is it, very good soil to, to grow plants. The second is uh, the difference in temperature between the night and day. I've been, uh, been told by many, by many producers in there, because obviously you're very high. So the difference in temperature for many parts of the year are quite important. And that yes, makes- Yes, and, and because the, the, light, the light in the day is very hot. So exactly. it's very easy to go from 16 to 40, 38, 40. <laughs> Which is absolutely crazy if you think about that. And then the third thing is, they're there today. You don't know if they're gonna be there tomorrow, which uh, just give us like a sort of an emotional, an emotional and philosophical thought about you know our lack and privilege we are we are we are together. Jokes aside, you know, is uh, yeah. this, this is always what they, what they say. How how will this eruption affect the grapes for this vintage? It's Actually, it won't. Ask him. It, it, it does, uh, it will not, as long as uh, we have a sort of fertilization coming from the sky, as I said before, and this will help probably the future, not this vintage, but the future of the consistency of the soil, uh, because it will mix uh, to the sand and to the stone. The Etna is a good friend. Well, it, it definitely is. It definitely, for what you, you told us today, it definitely I, is. I think it's like the sea. As long as you have respect of it, you don't you don't have to worry about. Fantastic! Yeah. If beautiful phrase from Ian, if the if the vines have been there hundred years, then they dodge the volcano by an old house on Etna. We are with you, Ian. Very nice suggestion. It's actually true. Um, the question we asking everybody is: Can we come and visit you? Absolutely, and I was just saying, a big plane and uh, organize a visit. We are, we are 45 minutes from, uh, uh, from Catania, one hour from Catania, so it's quite common, it's quite uh, uh, easy to get there. Mm, just uh, advise me in advance. Yeah, I you think by, by, by if, we got, if we carry on like we do now, I think it's gonna be by 2027. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I have uh, a... A olive tree, I have an olive tree just inside uh, the vineyard that is uh, 800 years old. And this makes the shadow for all of you and even more people. So 
please come and we can stay there and drink a profumo di volcano under the olive tree. Fantastic. And uh, I, there was a photo that you sent me about the olive tree. Should we just very quickly talk about this? Because uh, sure. it's not only wine there. Sure. It's, uh, if you went one second. I think it's going to get a bottle. <laughs> No, 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 no. So I made a, a sort of a picture of the olive tree, half of it because the other half couldn't fit, but by an architect. An architect. It's a, it's a, this olive tree is 800 years old, but wow. inside the vineyard we have about 150 plants from 200, 300 till 800 years. <laughs> So I produce uh, very little, but uh, if you come, you can taste my olive oil as well. Wow, a, wow, wow. A bonus for the invitation. Excellent, we'll be there. <laughs> I, I, I would stay with you all evening. I don't know about, about the others. And uh, you know, I can quite happily um, open a few bottles of these, but I run out. So I, I have to move to the next wine. There's no other way around it. Uh, but feel free to stick with us. Um, yeah, I will. If, if, if you have time and you want. Uh, you need to know that we do a very silly thing at the end of every event, and we vote for the best wine of the evening. And every event, the wine of the special guest wins. And we don't know why. We obviously very good at choosing special guests and choosing wines. So please stick with us, because uh, you I probably will for a win. Ah, grazie. Ciao a tutti. Grazie a te, Ciao. grazie Ciao. Federico. Thank you very much. Um, so let's eat. This is absolutely fascinating, isn't it, Mark? I, 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 I especially like the fact that we might look at you, Paolo and Ima, and you might be the future of, of winemaking in Palermo, or, no, sorry, <laughs> in, uh, in, uh, in Aglianico, in Campania, or, you know, <laughs> maybe you're going to go to Valpolicella. No, so then, you, uh, no, 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 you forget my love about Vesuvio, eh? Because we talk about that now, we don't forget last time Vesuvio, eh? Piedi Rosso. I can also see you, I can also see you with a nice tenuta in Collio, I have to say, to make some ribolla. <laughs> <laughs> right, so let's move on uh, to Sardegna and uh, the opposite corner of Sardegna. So we went to the Northeast, we had this amazing Vermentino, uh, and then we were very debated again, as always, when we tried to choose the wine, etc. And we are like, why don't we go and tell everybody about a wine that not many people have heard about? And we, we, we like to do this, a little bit of discovery. So many people have heard of Canonao, they try Canonao, he's the number one red. And then as Anto was saying before, let's not forget Carignano, especially Carignano of the Sulcis uh, kind. Ima, over to you, because I need to do some eating, because I've, I've been taken too much by the old thing. Yeah, thank you so much. You, know, you forget that I'm still a human being and I can do it as well, <laughs> but I understand your point. <laughs> well, yes, as we were saying on the beginning, uh, we will talk about what is island into island. And we do have a little island that is actually connected to the land of Sardinia by Little Canal as well. So you can go by, the, you can go by car. That is the one of Sant'Antonio. Uh, the highland of Sant'Antonio is famous for the production of uh, Carignan. That is, uh, like we say, the, the relation that is between the Spanish, uh, uh, the Spanish Empire and everything that is on Sardinia and the grapes that grown on Sardinia is of course related as well to what we do now. And uh, the Carignano uh, in uh, the island of Sant, uh, Santiago, sorry, Sant'Antioco is the one. Uh, Sant'Antioco. Sant Sant <laughs> Somebody help us here. Sant'Antioco. Yeah. It's even difficult for us to pronounce. It is Antani, 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 exactly. Antani. Come se fosse okay, Antani. Okay. Lui. Uh, let's, uh, let's understand that uh, it's my second bottle of wine this evening, you know, and they're still I'm a human being as well. Anyway. Uh, we are uh, in a sandy soil for sure, and what allowed the sandy soil to do in the past of the year to divide what was the phylloxera, no? So what they kept is um, 
really old vines. And what do old vines do? The old vines produce a little yield. So you do have a lot of uh, powerful wines in this kind, but powerful in the way of uh, a lot of fruitiness in it and gives you a great product as well. So the Carignan becomes famous on the, uh, on the time. And then on the end, he got as well a DOC. So he got a recognition from the state, even if sometimes it's not that's the most important thing that you can have. Uh, but in your glass, you will find a wine that is related, yes, to the fruit, but it is well related to what is the vegetable notes we were talking about before, you know. On my nose, is on the first time you find, uh, for example, the pepper. Not the same that you find in the Cabernet Franc, okay, don't get me wrong, but you do have uh, lovely notes. And uh, you, what we, when we talk about pre vines, we do have to understand that we talk about a miracle that happened. Thanks to um, soils like the Vulcan on the Etna, thanks to the soil that we have uh, uh, on, the, on this island, so sandy soil, we didn't allow this little pest to give us uh, trouble, so to, to delay everything that was as uh, our heritage in vines in Europe. So we kept the Carignan. And here in uh, La Tenuta La Sabiosa, Sabiosa actually has a sand. So they try to do uh, everything that is possible to keep what is the, the traditional method of the production in the vineyard and then to use during the way making what is uh, the, the modern age gave us. So they give you a really nice uh, and enjoyable wine, even if the Carignan for me is a powerful grape. So sometimes it can be too much. In this case, I do enjoy uh, this, uh, this drink in this moment, actually. What do you think? I think um, I'm with you. Carignan is usually quite um, yeah. in your face, isn't it? It's, it's, it's nice and powerful and to the point. Um, I like this. He still retain the power of Carignan, I, I would say. Uh, he, he gets a little bit more of those darker notes, so if you if you go back to your um, uh, your metaphors of colors, I would say that we're getting a little bit darker here with, with really sort of the fruits are becoming darker, becoming bluer uh, and deeper. Um, the spiciness is lovely, I would say. Um, and I like the, the balsamic of it. Absolutely. Very, very good. Very satisfying and balanced. You can see the color is very deep compared to what we had before from Federico, in which the color was a ruby, very nice and lively and transparent. We're just going deep. And um, um, the sense that we say is those wines that are a bit powdery in their texture. I don't know if you if you agree with me. Um, and uh, the, the, the producer is 100% uh, obviously organic and he's really into um, the, the total respect for, for the natural ways. Um, I have to say, though, that, you know, we're talking about a wine that really is grown on, 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 on a beach, you know, on, on, a, on, a, on sand. Uh, Tenuta La Sabiosa is called La Sabiosa because this wine is exactly. And uh, what I should have done and I didn't do, but perhaps I found a photo and I'm going to send it to you via email together with the slide, is actually a photo of, of, of the vines because uh, he's, uh, yeah, uh, quite, um, quite important. Um, just to understand where he comes from. Many memories uh, to Andrea, uh, many memories. Uh, you know, it's a winemaker in Calasetta, Santioco. Ah, oh, wow, fantastic. So we have, uh, we have the opportunity to go and visit them as well. <laughs> if, Anto, if Anto is going to allow us uh, one way or the other, that's great. Ready to go in my Paolo? Absolutely. Yeah. I would love to visit Santioco. I've never been. Uh, I'm sure Mrs. Czerneka would like to do a nice Slovenian tour. Um, many memories for me. We can be there. And Paolo agrees as well. Andrea is saying, I can taste licorice in this one. She was thinking for herself. That's why I reply with, the, we can do. We can go. Ah, exactly. <laughs> okay, fine. Let's just, just go on, Bruno. No worries. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on liquidis. Yeah, I can, I can feel that sort of note in there. And it's a note that I found very often because I'm a great lover of liquidis, like everybody knows. Yeah, but there was a question uh, on uh, ungrafted wine uh, bank, yeah. what they are. Again. Well done, well done for catching that. Yeah. Uh, well, we did explain last time as well, uh, what is ungrafted wines? Is uh, a Piede Franco wines? Um, 
let's say that there was a little uh, bad pest that came um, a certain time in Europe and decided to destroy the vines. Uh, when this happened, this uh, pest came from America. And in America, they did have some vines that are resistant to this pest, but they don't do really great ones. I mean, they're trying to do now something, but that is not good as much as can be European grapes. So what they did, they took uh, the root of these American vines and they put it on a uh, vines that was European. When uh, you have this kind of uh, vines, you do not call, you call that grafted. When you have ungrafted, it's because they have their own roots. So let's say that they are original grapes. So they all came from Europe and they did have been affected from the phylloxera. So they are original grapes in their original vines in a way. And most importantly, they can reach an age that otherwise, you know, could have been uh, yeah, yeah, reached. Sure. We have uh, in Irpinia, let's come back to that, to Campania, a vines of uh, 300 years old in Irpinia. So yeah, and this is thanks to uh, a different uh, soil that can be avoiding phylloxera in a way. A 300 years old vine, a 800 years old olive tree. What are we gonna have uh, tonight? Let's have a look. 120 years old couple there? No, 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 it's not them. That's just mom and dad, all right. Excellent. So yes, I don't know what you think about this wine. Um, I really like it. And um, I, uh, I was very sort of aware of, uh, uh, what could follow uh, Federico's wine? Because um, um, it's just so different and it's not about power. It's just about character, I think. It's not about power, it's just about character. And I, I, I was very tempted to switch them at one point, even if the alcohol content was different, just to get that sort of uh, feeling at the end. But I have to say that these sort of withstand uh, everybody that needs, you know, that sort of uh, uh, deep sensation in the wine, the sort of muscle. That sort of hundred meters uh, runners, uh, and I think we achieved that with a with a with a great product at a reasonable uh, price. If you think about the sort of yields and the difficulty that you get into uh, work in that sort of land, I think is is brilliant. It's a 2017 vintage, uh, many certifications. Um, yeah, biological, 14 percent. I particularly like, I especially like it. it, it's really, really good. So with this, we sort of conclude, if anybody's got uh, any other question, here we go, some more messages coming through. Uh, yes, the, the food uh, food pairing, wild boar or porcheddu with this, uh, with this red. Andrea, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, I will go for a nice wild boar uh ragu or the nice wild boar steak and uh, and um, porcedu okay. what are your favorite cavalliano de sul cheese my other favorite cavalliano de sul cheese uh terre brune yes i tried it and i think it's very very good i have to say i'm not an expert because i haven't tasted enough of it but if at any point there is a tasting dedicated to sardinia and cavalliano de sul cheese in particular i'm pretty sure myself Ima and paolo are going to be ready with our trade reference and uh, we're going to go and explore more but yes i've i've, um, I've tried tele brune uh, it was many years ago um, and i do have a good memory of it yeah absolutely absolutely um the uh, british um, uh, the british uh, food taste food uh, pairing uh, here i will go again into pie territory and uh, I would be controversial and I would say steak and egg pie. Steak and egg pie, nice, good, greasy, lovely, classic. Uh, and yes, I think that would go lovely with it. Uh, this wine compared to the previous wine, I will see always with red meat. But as you know, as the power of the wine goes up, I usually like the, the, the pairing with more charcoal -y sort of method of cooking the meat. So more sort of carbon infused flavors in there that I think go very well with this sort of power and this sort of uh, uh, depth of the, the wine. Uh, love the two reds tonight, Barry and Trudy. You're my man, I'm expecting a, a valid order from you this week. Um, 
outward butchers for that. Absolutely, Ruth, you, you, you're absolutely right. The outward butchers, I think it's a very expensive one. In the hint of rosemary. Oh, I like Glenn because the Glenn obviously. Uh, as his nose and palate is very well trained by uh, hours and hours of whiskey tasting we are together. So um, he is able to pick up on quite a lot of very sort of uh, hidden scents. But yes, I can, uh, I can get the rosemary there. Yeah, I can get the rosemary with the steak. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cook in a second if I carry on drinking it. Absolutely. Excellent. So if anyone has got nothing else to say, it's the very sad time in which I'm going to go for the last page. I'm going to thank everybody, especially I'm going to thank our hero of the night, Federico Graziani from Mount Etna, uh, Imma and Paolo for their impeccable Italian domestics that are really making the way on all the possible social media platform I have myself. Um, you don't know that... Um, at the same time with the event, I'm running four or five uh, WhatsApp conversations of everybody commenting on top of what we already commenting in the event. So if you see me distracted or in need of food or more wine, you know exactly why. When are we going to get a discount? This is a great question. So I would <laughs> like to open up uh, a, little, a little moment for me to do my little commercial. Dun, 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 dun. Welcome to the wine uh, place, uh, italianwines.com. Please do go online, order cases and cases of any wine that you possibly have drunk tonight. And uh, for the one who purchased our ticket online, uh, immediately after the event, I'm going to send a very special discount code. This discount code you can use. Uh, originally, it was only for 48 hours after the event. Then I did understand that it was uh, hopeless with, the, with my customers and I always had to sort of uh, stretch it for weeks after. So yes, I will, I will put it on and it will be valid for a couple of weeks. Uh, you can go there and enjoy at least three bottles of wine and get 15 pounds off. For whoever bought the event series, so the all events together, obviously 15 pounds are not gonna cut it because the amount of wine you're gonna order is gonna be gargantuous so please uh, hold on there because you do have a 75 pounds voucher that i've already sent to you via email now if you don't want to use these vouchers all in once and you want to sort of adventure into two or three different orders just email me i sort of have the powers to override any sort of discount code if you didn't buy uh, your uh, event online but you bought directly with me then you need to make me feel very nice and important and massage my ego and uh, make me feel very important and good and you need to laugh at my jokes and then maybe when you're going to place an order i'm going to look after you properly i hope this is sort of um, um putting the commercial side of this tasting a rest for the day uh, i have thank you for yeah the shirt is good i have to say um my friend Carl, I don't know if he's there as well, shares with me, well, with my wife, looks like, uh, the passion for this brand of shirts. They're called Frangipani. I'm going to write it down. If anybody wants to be a little bit Bruno or Carl in, uh, in a bee, um, you can order those online. They're very nice, actually, and they're very comfortable. And they have the designs that will really... Uh, here we go. Frangipani, the code UK, I think it is. Do we get a discount for the shirts, too? My mom has the same curtains. Was that? That's one. That's my line. You just copied it from me. Okay. Uh, we love you, Bruno. You are so funny and well dressed. Thank you, Ruth. You said exactly the right thing. Immediately for you, twenty-five percent off. Ooh, very well done. Oh no, that was uh, oh that was uh, guy apparently. Oh, that is all getting wrong. Anyway, thank you very much. We got the last episode next week, and it's very sad because yeah. all of these is sort of gonna end which is terrible. Maybe we should do another one. Maybe I'm thinking about it. And I've got something special lined up for you next week. What I'm going to try to do next week, and I know it's going to be probably a little bit longer. It's going to go on for long, but it's the last time. So we need to make it special because we got the grand finale. So I was thinking about doing two things. And then you tell me if you agree or not. Okay. The first one, I wanted to invite producers, guests. 
So instead of having one special guest, we're going to have four special guests. Next time. I don't know if you agree with that, but it's more or less already done. So that's uh, my surprise. Um, and, um, and then the other thing is for a bit of fun, whoever wants to, I think it will be very nice simply because my tuxedo has been in a, in a wardrobe for about a year because I couldn't go and wear it anywhere because nobody's inviting me to party anymore. Uh, for the COVID and for other reasons. I think we should just sort of dress up for the occasion, for the last thing, like we should go into the Claridge's for a very important night out. So I will I will definitely get my tuxedo out. Uh, uh, shirt and ties are very welcome, and we want to see uh, how possibly all the ladies are going to work out their, uh, their, their, their uh, hairdressing skills without going to the hairdresser. And uh, so please do. Uh, by all means, uh, uh, get on board with us. We're going to have an amazing selection of wine. We're going to go to Piemonte, which is a dedicated event. And four wines are not going to be enough to tell the story, but anyway. So without, without any more information, because obviously next week event is already sold out, so we can even advertise it. Uh, I really thank everybody. And I'm going to stop the recording now. Thank you very much.